Welcome to the Disney Wedding Podcast. This show is brought to you by Carrie Hayward's Fairy Tale Weddings Guide, the only guidebook and bridal organizer tailored exclusively to Disney's fairy tale weddings at Walt Disney World. I'm Carrie Hayward, and each week I feature Disney wedding updates, money saving tips, and interviews with wedding vendors and real Disney couples. I also cover honeymoons, anniversaries, and engagements at the Disney parks and resorts. Join me now as the Disney Wedding Podcast celebrates romance at Disney destinations. Today on the Disney Wedding Podcast, we are talking all about Disney wedding menu planning to help you save money and get exactly the food you want at all the events for your wedding or vow renewal at Walt Disney World. My guest today is Abby Rodriguez, who was married at Walt Disney World, and she's going to help me share with you a lot of tips and tricks that are going to help you get the best menus for all of your events. So welcome, Abby. Hi, Carrie. Thank you so much for having me. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for being on the show today. Can you tell my listeners a little bit about your wedding at Walt Disney World? Absolutely. My husband and I got married at the Wedding Pavilion, and we had our reception at the Grand Floridian at Salon 6. Okay, great. So for today's episode, we're going to focus mostly on menus specifically. But if you have questions about anything else to do with food and beverage at your Disney wedding, that is all in chapter four of the Fairy Tale Weddings Guide. So if you want to know about food and beverage minimums, whether you should do plated versus buffet, how much it costs for kids, how about vendors, how do beverages work, what does BOC mean, what can I get for my cake, all of that is in chapter four of the Fairy Tale Weddings Guide. And I will also put in the notes for this post on DisneyWeddingPodcast.com links to episodes I've done all about cake. I have one where I interviewed a woman who used to do wedding cakes at Walt Disney World, and we talked about, you know, how to get the price down, how do you get a custom cake. And then I also have an episode where we talk about the bar and specifically what is BOC, how can it save you money, all the things you need to know when you're planning the bar. So, but this episode is going to be all about the menus specifically. So I'm going to start right out with my top tips for menu planning at Walt Disney World. So my number one tip, and the thing I see people ask the most questions about, is that you do not have to stick with any menu Disney has sent you. So if your planner has said, oh, you're having a dessert party, here's the menu, that is not the only menu. That is their suggested menu. That might be this year's latest menu. However, you can customize the menu at any event that you're planning through Disney. So you can take a menu that they send you, you can look through the bazillions of menus that I have on the catered event menu menus page of fairytaleweddingsguide.com and you can customize that or you can do one from scratch and just say hey we want x y and z what can the chef do this is something that trips a lot of people up because they think well i was just sent this one menu and i don't like anything on it do not worry about it you can totally customize it and if you're looking through these old sample menus on my site and you see one that says it's for 20 people or more don't worry about that when you customize it, it doesn't matter. They will tell you how much it costs based on your guest count, but the menu is just meant to give you ideas of things that you might want to include. My next tip is you can have any type of food at any event at any time of day. So sometimes I see people say, oh, my husband loves Mickey waffles, but we're having a dinner reception. I guess we have to only have dinner foods. No, you can have all breakfast at dinner if you want. They don't care. The only limits on the type of food you can have at an event are related to like the distance from the kitchen and also how eatable it is if there's not 100% seating. So examples of that, say you want an ice sculpture, but you're outdoors at Epcot. They may say, you know what, it's too far from the kitchen. Those things will be melted by the time they get there. Or if you want a steak, you're probably going to be encouraged to get sliders at a walk around dessert party because people aren't going to have silverware and be sitting down and able to saw into a full steak. So those would be the only limits. You can also have savory food at a quote unquote dessert party. So a lot of us talk a lot about dessert parties and what we mean are the private events that take place in front of the fireworks, either at the parks or at the resorts. We call them dessert parties as a shorthand, but you are not limited to desserts. And in fact, most of us add savory food because they happen later in the evening and your guests might have the munchies. So that's a great opportunity to mix it up. 
And then, as I mentioned, it's not limited by time of day. So you can have Mickey waffles and steak at your dinner. You could have steak at a 7 a.m. breakfast if you want. They don't care what time of day it is. It's whatever you want to have on your menu. For our rehearsal dinner, we did a dessert party at UK Lockside at Epcot. And of course, not everyone's going to want to eat dessert for dinner. So we had a lot of savory options and they were really great about accommodating our requests and really understood our vision using the dessert party as our rehearsal dinner. We, we did the nacho bar, which I've read everywhere is everyone's favorite part of their wedding. And it was definitely a highlight. And we had those savory options, but we also had a few desserts for the dessert party. And I feel like our guests really loved having a savory option, but not necessarily a traditional sit down meal. And it really just helped bring our vision together. And they they did a really great job helping us out with that. That's so great to hear. The next top tip is that Disney's per person food and beverage minimum. So this is the $140, $175, $210, depending on what time of day the meal is. That per person food and beverage minimum is not your menu price. So if you're having a brunch, that doesn't mean that your brunch menu has to cost $140. That's the total amount you have to spend on all food and beverages at your brunch. And if you have a pre-reception, the pre-reception included. So what you can do is take that per person minimum, subtract the per person price of cake, which you can get from your planner, and the per person price of drinks, And the number that's left is the lowest price your menu can be. So this is great if you're on a budget. Say you're trying to meet 175 for a lunch and your cake and your drinks come to 75 per person. That means that all the other food and drinks that you serve at the event only have to add up to $100 for you to meet that per person food and beverage minimum. This can also be a great way to get a lot of bang for your buck by allowing the chef to set a menu at that price. So if you don't have a ton of ideas about what you want to do, maybe you have a theme or there's one design Disney dish that you love, you can have your planner tell the chef, or if you're at the menu tasting event, you can talk to a chef. You can tell them, okay, I want a menu that costs $100 per person and it's, you know, Western themed or it's around the world at Epcot and let them come up with the items that will meet that price point. And usually they come up with way better stuff than we can just think of off the top of our heads. We definitely had that experience, especially at the tasting. We got so many great ideas from the chefs themselves, things that I never would have thought of, like an action station for, you know, pineapple bread pudding with the ice cream. And they really helped you understand that there are so many possibilities and things that you would never know unless you talk to them. So it's really cool how they can pull together a vision for you. That's a really great point. And we're going to talk later in this episode about the menu tasting event. If you're able to go to that, that can be a great way to customize your menu. Love it. So the next top tip, Disney is amazing with allergies and restricted diets. So often people will ask, what do I do? I have a family member who's vegan. I have somebody who can't eat peanuts. They're so used to dealing with this kind of thing. You can have gluten-free, vegan, vegetarian, allergy-free, anything that you need for your group. You can work with the chef to customize something that goes with that. Make sure that all of this is written in your BEO, your banquet event order. I have a whole other show where we talk about that, the getting started episode. But basically, it's the Bible of your day. And so if you have it written in there, so-and-so guest, you put their name in there, is vegetarian. So-and-so guest can't have gluten then they'll know who needs to be served what meal, depending on what you settled on with the chef. Another tip, you can have park foods or family favorites. So if there's something you really love, for a while there, people were super obsessed with the carrot cake cookies in Hollywood Studios. If there's something in the parks or maybe at Food and Wine Festival that you love, you can try to have the catering team at your event venue recreate it. But it might not taste the same. They always give you that caveat because they don't want somebody to be like, I had Le Cellier cheddar cheese soup at an event at Hollywood Studios and it didn't taste the same because it's not being created by the same chefs and sometimes not the same recipes, although they can try to get the same recipes, but they do a pretty good job. And most of the time when I interview people who have had park favorite foods recreated, they rave about what they got. You can also try to have them create family recipes or versions of family recipes. It's been a mixed bag on this. 
I've interviewed some people who said, you know, we gave them grandma's recipe and they were able to scale it up for a buffet or whatever. But in some cases, they'll just say, sorry, I don't think we're going to be able to approximate this. But it's always worth asking because, again, the chefs love to be given something out of the ordinary. And sometimes they come up with really creative solutions. Abby, did you have any park foods or other Disney favorites at your wedding? We did. Park foods and resort food was a really big part of our process when we were planning our menu. My husband and I, we love the Polynesian and we love Ohana. The morning that he proposed to me in front of the castle, we were at Ohana getting breakfast. So it definitely holds a very special place in our hearts. And we really wanted to put that into our menu. So we had our entire menu was based off of the Ohana dinner. And they did a really great job of recreating it. It's definitely slightly different, as you were saying, Carrie, because it's not coming straight from Ohana. But they did a really good job of listening to what we wanted and like our priorities. We also had cheeseburger spring rolls from the spring roll cart at Magic Kingdom at our dessert party. And we had pineapple bread pudding from Ohana. So it was a really cool way to work in our park favorites and share them with our family who don't often get to come here. So that was really special for us. That's a great point. Using park food can be a great way to show your friends and family what you love about the parks. And I have to say those cheeseburger spring rolls, I've been told many times by guests that the ones they got at their catered event for their wedding were actually better than the ones they'd had in Magic Kingdom. <laughs> I totally agree. They're, they're definitely on a different level of the tomato curry sauce they come with. Really gave it the kick it needed. It was, it was really good. That's awesome. And then my last top tip is about California Grill. People get super stressed out because California Grill, you have to use the restaurant's menus. It's not catered by the catering team where you have unlimited options. You have to work with their menus, but their menus can be customized. So you can swap items among different menus. And there are certain items you can actually add, basic things like Mickey waffles if you want. So don't be worried if you, you know, oh, we have picky eaters or I love California Grill, but my husband's not too sure. You can work with them within the parameters, the different menus that they have. And I've never interviewed anyone who came away saying they didn't do what we wanted at California Grill. Always they are just raving about how great the food is. Okay, so now we're going to go through the different types of catered events you might have at your wedding or vow renewal at Walt Disney World and just give you some tips for each one. So we'll start with what Disney calls the pre-reception, but in the real world, they call it the cocktail hour. This is sometimes confusing to people when they start planning Disney weddings. They're like, what is a pre-reception? That is the cocktail hour, and it's usually between the ceremony and the reception. Sometimes if you're off taking pictures, you need to feed or water your guests while they're waiting for you. So first of all, you can have as many items on your pre-reception or cocktail hour menu as you want. I know a lot of people who are from the New York City metro area have been to these competitive weddings where everybody tries to one-up the last wedding they went to by having 15 million different types of appetizers during cocktail hour. If you want 15 million appetizers at cocktail hour, Disney will happily do that for you, but you probably only need about three items. <laughs> And one reason that people think they need a lot is because they think the food's going to run out. Disney knows how many guests you have and they know how to estimate how much quantity there should be. So you don't ever have to worry about, you know, we need to have 10 different items because I don't want things to run out. If you get three items, they're going to give you enough food that those three items will feed your guests as much as they want to eat during your cocktail hour. But by the same token, you don't want to spoil your guests' appetite at the cocktail hour and then have them just pick at the main meal, which is where you're spending most of your money. However, it is helpful to give them something to nibble on if you're serving alcohol at the cocktail hour because they need something to soak up all that booze. So it's kind of a fine line, but if you're on a budget, doing something like a cheese display or a fruit and cheese platter will give your guests something to chew on, but it's not going to spoil their appetites for the meal to come. And then the other thing people don't realize, and I didn't even realize when I was planning my wedding until we just said, okay, can we drop this? You don't have to have a pre-reception. So if you're doing a first look with your spouse before the ceremony, you can do all of your couple's photos before the ceremony and then go straight to the reception with your guests or just take a little bit of time to take photos and then head to the reception with your guests. And that is going to save you money on all the food and beverages that you might have had to serve during your pre-reception. So depending on what kind of event you want, whether you want to do a first look, that can be a great way to save money. 
Abby, do you have any recommendations from your pre-reception? So at our pre-reception, we had vegetable spring rolls, beef teriyaki skewers, and bacon wrapped scallops, and everyone loved them. I think that three was just enough. I was also concerned that three wasn't going to be enough. What if someone didn't like, you know, beef or scallops or they don't like spring rolls? So I was concerned that we didn't have enough, but everyone loved them. They were phenomenal. It was the best feeling ever getting into, you know, the room with my husband and they gave us a plate of food. The beef teriyaki skewers were incredible. People still talk about them to this day. And I think that we stress about those things, you know, the small stuff. Is there going to be enough food? There will definitely be enough food. That is your time to, you know, soak in the day and not have to worry about playing a hostess. You've done all that you can. You've planned this great event and, you know, three or four, I think is great. And I've also been to weddings where there's way more than that. There's these crazy displays and it's a bit overwhelming. But if, if you want all of those options, I'm sure Disney will take care of you and make sure that everyone gets what they want. Yeah, definitely. That's great advice. Okay, so then the things to know about the reception, the same menus that you are sent or that you find on my website are available at every reception venue except those few like California Grill where they're catered by someplace other than the convention catering team at the location. So California Grill has its own menus. Enchanted Rose at the Grand Floridian uses private dining menus from the Grand Floridian. And then Trader Sam's, they've come up with this very limited menu that they will serve there. And then Tiffin's in Animal Kingdom is another place where you have to use custom menus that are catered by the Tiffin's kitchen. Otherwise, if you're at any other venue, you can use any menu anywhere. They used to label the menus with like boardwalk breakfast options and Grand Floridian desserts. They don't do that so much anymore. But if you find an old one on my site and it has stuff you want on it, you can ask for that stuff. It doesn't matter what resort or park it says on the name of the menu. If you're at a venue that says it's buffet only, it doesn't mean that you can't have fancy food. And I know that out in the real world, sometimes buffets are seen as kind of low rent and fancy weddings have plated food. But at Disney, you can have super fancy food on your buffet menu if you want, and you could have a plated menu that's like barbecue if you want. So don't worry that your guests are going to think you cheaped out just because you have to have a buffet because you're outdoors at Epcot or someplace where they can't do plated menus. You're going to be able to have amazing stuff on your buffet. And if you do choose to do a plated menu because your venue allows it, there are a couple ways to do it. You can get your guests to tell you their choices on their RSVP to your wedding, and then you communicate all of that to your planner about 30 days out. You could serve a duo plate, so that would be like you serve surf and turf, you have lobster and steak. Or you could do what they call signature service, and this is where you let guests choose on the spot what they want to eat, but it's super expensive because Disney has to make a certain amount of everything in order to cover what they think people are going to order. So you're basically paying for, you know, two or three meals per person. So usually the best way to do it is just to get your guests to tell you what they want and then submit that beforehand if you're doing a plated menu. Another thing people don't know is that you can request your own special meals. So often I've interviewed couples who one partner wanted to have steak, but there wasn't steak on the menu for everybody else, but the convention catering team made a mistake. Or maybe one partner loves stuff from Ohana and they're able to make the noodles and only she gets the noodles. So Disney can customize special meals just for you if that's what you want. And then the last thing to know about reception food is the food service lasts 90 minutes. And sometimes people think that's too long and sometimes people think that's too short, but Disney has figured out that that is the perfect amount of time to serve food. So and that can be a good opportunity to close your bar and save a little money if you are doing a bar where you aren't prepaying because people are usually just sitting for that whole time. But that's just something to know when you're doing your plans. Abby, do you have any tips from your reception? So we had a buffet for our lunch reception, and I really love buffets. <laughs> I think it's nice because you can have a little bit of everything. You can pick what you like and what you don't like. And I thought that with our buffet, people really enjoyed having that option. And they also get to mingle, too. You know, when you're sitting at a table with the same 10 people kind of all night when you're not dancing, you don't really get the opportunity to get up and talk to people at dinner. 
I feel like at our wedding with the buffet, people got to mingle. It kind of got people up to the bar a little bit more. So I think that it, there's also like a social component to the buffet. But I really loved having all those options. And I also love a plated dinner. But for our guest count, we had about 55 people. I thought the buffet was great. That's a really good point that, yeah, a buffet makes it a little more social and it maybe even makes your party seem a little more jumping because people are getting up and moving around. And yeah, that's a great point. For sure. Okay, great. So let's talk briefly about cake. As I mentioned, I have an entire episode about cake with all of the tips for, you know, what flavors can I have? How do I customize it? I want it to look exactly like this. All of that is in the cake episode, but let's just talk about it briefly. The first thing that throws a lot of people when they start planning to have a cake at a Disney wedding is that there are no standard cake designs. They used to have this PDF that they would send out with cake designs that they had named and they had photos of and you could match them up and find out exactly how much it cost and it was super convenient. But then I think they realized that everybody wants a custom cake and so now every cake is a custom cake and the way you find out how much it's going to cost is to submit photos or maybe a drawing or a design of what you want and then the pastry team will get back to you through your planner to tell you how much it costs. Something I see people worry about a lot, if you get a cake with fondant on it, there is buttercream underneath the fondant. So many people are like, oh, I want a fondant cake with that's really elaborate, but I hate fondant, and so I have to order a buttercream one. No, you're going to get buttercream. There's this very thick layer under the fondant, and usually Disney will peel off the fondant. After you do your ceremonial cake cutting, they will cut the cake into pieces, and they almost always peel off the fondant unless you request them to keep it on. And I will say, they use this really fancy brand of fondant that I have had so many people tell me, this is the best fondant I've ever had. I can't believe it. I actually ate the fondant on my cake. So that might be worth remembering when you're planning whether you're going to do a fondant or a buttercream cake. You can also have different flavor combinations in each tier. So you're doing the tasting kit. You can't decide between churro with churro mousse and the Dole Whip flavored cake combination. You could have one tier with each. And that's a great way to offer variety to your guests as well. And if you get the cake price back through your planner and it's like giving you a heart attack, you can always have your planner ask the chef what can be changed about your design to make it cheaper. So the first thing people always ask is, could I do a fake cake? But fake tiers are not cheaper because all of the cost of the cake is in the decoration. So that's not usually a good way to save money. The other thing you can do to make your cake go farther is to serve the top tier. Disney always assumes that you're going to save the top tier and bring it home on the plane and shove it in the freezer and eat stale cake a year later. But if you serve the top tier then, you can always come back to Disney and get a replica made on your anniversary and eat fresh cake. Or you can ask a local bakery to make you a fresh cake on your anniversary. So that can be a good way to make it go farther. And if you do want to have guests take slices home, you need to bring your own boxes for that. So Disney, at the end of the night, if there's any cake left, they're supposed to give it to you, but they hand it to you in one or two or three, depending on how many tiers you have, giant boxes from the bakery. So if you want guests to be able to take individual slices home, bring your own boxes for them to use. Abby, did you guys have a cake at your wedding? We did not have a cake at our wedding. We're not big cake people. We did do the tasting kit and we loved it. But after a lot of thought, we didn't think that the cost of a cake was really something that we wanted to put our budget towards. So we did prioritize other desserts and people loved having that variety. I think that for people who aren't super in love with cake, and I know there's a couple, there has to be, um, (laughs) then I think that having little mini desserts is a really great option. Uh, That was something that I had mentioned to the chefs and said, we're kind of on the fence about having a cake, but we do want some dessert, something really, you know, different. And they had a lot of great suggestions on how we can really make it unique and Disney and yummy. (laughs) And that really kind of filled that cake void for us. That's a really good point. Yeah, you don't automatically have to have a cake just because it's a wedding or a vow renewal. And I've seen everything from cupcakes to a donut tower. What kind of stuff did you guys have? We had a pineapple bread pudding action station. And we had some Mickey ice cream sandwich parfaits. That was something that we tried at the menu tasting that we loved. And also from the menu tasting, we loved the Mickey waffle whoopie pies. So we had a kind of different flavor profiles for all three of our desserts and people really liked the variety. 
And the action station with the pineapple bread pudding, it was warm and it came with vanilla ice cream and people really loved that. I was worried that people were going to miss cake or be disappointed they were at a wedding without a cake. But it seemed like everyone really enjoyed the desserts. I know I really enjoyed the bread pudding. So it felt like we made the right decision there. That's great. And I'm glad you brought up the cake tasting kit also, because that's something, if you're wondering what this is, they do this thing now where you can go to the Grand Floridian and pick up a kit that has different flavors of cake and filling to try so that you know what to order for your wedding cake. And all the details on ordering that are in chapter one of Carrie Hayward's Fairy Tale Weddings Guide. So speaking of desserts, let's talk about the dessert party. As I mentioned earlier, it doesn't have to be dessert. Usually this is a private event that you have in front of the fireworks, either inside Epcot, at Fantasmic in Hollywood Studios, or at one of the monorail resorts where you can watch the Magic Kingdom fireworks across the water. So often it is desserts because maybe you've just come from the wedding, or maybe because it's nighttime you don't want to give people heavy food, but like I mentioned, you can have any kind of food there. You can have savory food. This is a great opportunity to have DIY foods. So that would be something like a nacho bar, like Abby mentioned, or DIY mac and cheese, something that looks like a lot of variety and gives your guests lots of options, but doesn't actually cost very much because it's just the one action station instead of being, you know, 10 different individual menu items. And then for desserts, a great way to do that on the cheap is to have a bill on consumption cart full of ice cream novelties. So this is the ice cream sandwiches and bars that you can get in the parks. They will bring an actual cart to your event and let guests just go wild, pulling out whatever they want, and you only pay for what people actually eat. So that's another way to, instead of spending tons of money on little fancy individual desserts, it gives people a lot of variety, but it's less expensive. At a dessert party, the food service lasts 60 minutes. Dessert parties last two hours tops. Sometimes they're shorter, like if you're all going on a ride mix-in after the fireworks end, you get hustled out as soon as the fireworks end. So the maximum amount of time you're going to be there is two hours and 60 minutes is the food service. You could extend it, like if you really want to do 90 minutes, by paying a prorated per person amount. So they'll take the cost of your menu per person. If you want to extend it by half an hour and it's a 60 minute menu, then they divide it in two and they add that on the price so that you can keep serving for longer than 60 minutes. But in general, most people find 60 minutes to be enough time. Yeah, so as I mentioned, we had the nacho bar, and that was also a really great way to kind of introduce comfort foods, too. When you're at Disney, you have so many options, and you're, you know, looking for those special park foods all the time, and a lot of our guests did stay for the parks and got to, you know, have their favorite park foods, but nachos, I think, were really cool because they had a lot of options with the nacho bar too. I was worried that we were just going to get, you know, some chicken and some queso, but they gave us a lot of options. We had like pico de gallo, salsa, queso, olives, lettuce, refried beans. And it was really cool because everyone had something and it was DIY too. And everyone loves that. We uh, also had little individual desserts too, and we based those off of our favorite Disney snacks. We had some cannolis and we had the whipped cream puffs. So that was a really cool way to integrate the park food. Uh, something that I wish that we could have done was, like you said, Carrie, have those novelty ice creams. I think it's really cool that they bring out the cart. And for the people who aren't staying, you know, and going through the park days, having that classic Mickey bar at your event is really cool. And that's that's a cool experience that they're never going to get at another wedding. Definitely. Yeah, that's a great point. And then if you decide to add any other events around your wedding, like a welcome party or a farewell party... Any catered event that you add on to the wedding has no per person food and beverage minimum. The only food and beverage minimum you need to meet is the one at whatever venue you use. That can be good to remember because, you know, you spend so much of your time planning trying to stick to this $140, $175, $210 per person. But when it comes to these extra events, you don't have that, which is great. It gives you a little more freedom. It's a great place to economize. So again, with DIY and themed food. So rather than serving steak dinner or a pheasant under glass, you know, you do your mac and cheese bar or you do a barbecue or you have themed food. Maybe you're in Animal Kingdom and you have 
foods themed to the different areas of Animal Kingdom, and that can help you keep the cost down but still be fun and unique for your guests. Abby, did you guys add any other events to your wedding? We didn't. We only had our dessert party slash rehearsal dinner, but something that I look back on and one thing maybe I would have changed was using private catering to have breakfast the morning of the wedding. The night before, we were kind of scrambling, trying to figure out what we were going to serve everybody as we were getting ready at 5 a.m. And I remembered that we could have gone through catering to make sure that we had some breakfast foods in the morning. So I guess that's a tip if you're getting ready really early and you want to make sure that everyone has food and you want to go through Disney, I think ordering that in advance is a really helpful tip. That's a great idea. Yeah. And so how you would do that, if you're paying Disney for a getting ready room at one of the convention centers, those have a $1,500 food and beverage minimum. So right there, you're going to have to serve some kind of food in order to meet that. If you're staying at a Disney resort and they have private dining, yeah, you can call even the day before and set up food to be delivered for breakfast in the morning. So you don't even have to think about it. And then what people do if they're someplace that doesn't have private dining is there are restaurants in the area that deliver or they use a food delivery service. So like Panera is a popular one or they send somebody out to get the food. Although I just interviewed a couple where I guess the groom spent a lot of time. He wasted a lot of time going off property to get food. So yeah, if you can arrange to have it delivered, that is the smart way to go. Absolutely. That was something that we definitely, or I forgot to do until the last minute in the day before the wedding. My mom had to run down to the boardwalk deli and just grab everything she could before they closed. So we would have something to eat in the morning. Even though the mornings are so hectic, you kind of forget to eat. So having that option for people definitely helps. Yeah, that's a great point. So now we're going to talk about the menu tasting event and have Abby share her experience at the one she attended. So the menu tasting event replaces the individual one-on-one menu tastings they used to do. Unfortunately, they don't have this anymore where you can go into the kitchen and you and your parents and future spouse get a private menu tasting. But instead, what they have is this group event where all the couples who are having their events in a certain month are invited to this group tasting, usually at one of the convention centers. They're usually held on Saturdays and a total of four people from your party can attend. And the chefs come up with a fixed menu so you don't get to request anything, but it can also be a great way to find new things because the chefs get a chance to show you new things and maybe they're tired of always making the same creme brulee or whatever. And so they've come up with new desserts or new menu items and you get to try them at this event. They can accommodate allergies, like if you have dietary restrictions or allergies, but again, you can't like custom order anything. The menu tasting event is only available to couples who are having a catered event that lasts three hours or longer. So that means if you're just having a celebration, like a dessert party, anything two hours or less, they're not going to send you an invite to this, which is kind of a bummer. But the idea is that if you're having a full reception, you're going to be serving more food and you need more help figuring out what the menus are going to be. The invitations have been going out about six months before your date for a tasting that occurs about four months before the event, but it can change. And if you're in a situation where maybe you're a teacher or there's something about your job that makes travel inflexible, some people have been able to reach out to their sales consultant and just say, hey, is there any chance I could get in on the menu tasting on X date? Or, you know, I would need to know a little in advance when this is coming up so that I can make my travel plans. So definitely talk to your sales consultant if you're worried about missing your opportunity to go to a menu tasting. And then the reason that these things are so great, not only do you get to try the food, you also get to chat with some of the chefs at the various event venues at Walt Disney World. And usually there are also Disney event planners who will have your BEO printed out and will help you go over it. So this is a fantastic opportunity to talk to a planner in person, ask all those questions that you otherwise would be emailing in a massive bullet pointed email and get answers directly from the source. So if you have have an opportunity to go to a menu tasting, it is a great idea. Abby, can you talk a little bit about the menu tasting you attended? Absolutely. We loved attending the menu tasting. We went four months before our wedding. And at that point, we didn't have an assigned planner. 
So it was really great to meet with the chefs and the planners on staff and to have that face to face time with them because obviously we're planning remotely and it's nice to just, you know, talk to someone and be able to fire off all your menu questions. We didn't really expect to have any opinions change of what we wanted on our menu going into it. We were very set on, you know, our Ohana inspired menu. And when we got there, we had some amazing food. We had some short ribs and um, these little toy box marinated tomatoes that changed our life. And we, we made some decisions to add those because of the tasting. And we never would have known unless we had gone. And one of our guest favorites on our menu was the short rib. Even people that don't really eat meat. My mom doesn't eat meat and she loves them. So we never would have known about that if it weren't for the tasting. So if you can, I highly recommend going. They also had really cool, it was really cool to see the setup that they had with the decor. And they had some really cool gumball machines with little cake balls in them. And I feel like it was a really good opportunity for couples to get inspiration. And um, if you're stuck on a menu and you're not sure which direction to take, the tasting is a really helpful outlet for that. We also spoke to Chef Rob at our table and he answered all of our crazy questions. They really want to make sure that you have the best day possible and get what you're looking for in your menu. And it was really great to talk to them and pick their brain and see, you know, what's your favorite? What are you seeing couples do? What are some mistakes that we should avoid? Um, And and that face-to-face time really helped us make some decisions about the menu. I'm glad you brought that up because, yeah, that's such a wonderful opportunity to speak directly often with the chef or with some chefs at the place where your meal is going to be made. And, yeah, getting to work with them and get their opinions, sometimes things you wouldn't even have thought of, they'll come up with ideas for you that will be amazing on the day of your event. And also the table display, you mentioned that, yeah, so usually they'll have a little bit of a display of decor at these menu tasting events. And that's nice because if you're holding your breath waiting for another bridal showcase, the last one they had was in 2020, the weekend that Walt Disney World shut down for the pandemic. It doesn't look like those are coming back anytime soon, especially with all the budget cuts at Disney. So this is your next best thing. Plus, you get this personalized attention from the planners and the chefs that you wouldn't at a huge bridal expo like the Bridal Showcase. So hopefully the tips that we've offered and the information and Abby's experience have helped you get a handle on how to plan the menu for your Disney wedding or vow renewal and all the various events that you want to have around it. Again, there are links in the post for this episode on DisneyWeddingPodcast.com. And of course, chapter four of the Fairy Tale Weddings Guide is filled to the brim with tips about how to customize and save money on food and beverages and cake at your Walt Disney World wedding. So Abby, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me today. You've offered so many great tips. I really appreciate your taking the time. Thank you so much for having me, Carrie. This was great. That's our show for today. I'm your host, Carrie Hayward, inviting you to join me again next week for another episode of the Disney Wedding Podcast. Past shows and tons of photos for each episode are available on my website, DisneyWeddingPodcast.com or listen in your favorite podcast app. And for instant answers to all your Walt Disney World wedding questions, check out Carrie Hayward's Fairy Tale Weddings Guide, available as an interactive ebook with continual free updates at fairytaleweddingsguide.com. <laughs>